So today we're changing to a slightly different uh, approach. As Green says, uh, in this chapter and the two following, we turn our attention from the questions of the intended reference of referring expressions uh, to questions of what the speaker intends to accomplish in saying what she says and saying it in the way she says it at the point in the discourse at which it is said. But in reality, and this is one of the problems with pragmatics, is people have considered these to be very different things. Oh, please put your phones away and your computers, like really away, not just on your desktop where it might light up. Hello, can you put your phone away? Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, this is one of the problems historically with pragmatics is people not seeing the different phenomena that we're going to be talking about or are talking about in this course as related in any way. They're, they're all who have been treated as separate phenomena. And so reference and the kind of things we're talking about today, speech acts, and then next week we'll talk about presuppositions, and then we talk about implicature. These were all treated as different things. Uh, and But we're going to, what I'm being arguing uh, throughout this course is that it's really all the same thing. They really all come down to inferring why the speaker said what they said. And that's it, really. Um, and so all of these very complicated things that we're going to see that people came up with for speech acts or presupposition or whatever, really can all be dealt with very, with very simple, uh, just uh, inductively inferring why the person did what they did. And it all started with Grice, who you may have heard about. And we'll talk about Grice in lecture, lecture 5, which is, this is lecture 4.1, and then there's 4.2, and then there's 5. Okay, so, um, so today we're talking about speech acts. So speech acts is uh, kind of, people notice that uh, when you are, speaking, you're often doing something, or actually I would say you're always doing something. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, in, the, in the past, there was a school of, uh, let, me, let me jump ahead and I'll come back. Uh, so there was a school of um, thought called logical positivism, which was the basis for a lot of modern logic. And it was their whole thing was about showing how sentences could be true or false. And so like that, those little, uh, you know, uh, uh, TF in the boxes, things that you learned about in semantics, that was all developed by these guys, and particularly Witt Wittgenstein came up with that. And so they were trying to say that, okay, these sentences can be considered true or false, so that they're good sentences. Anything that can't be considered true or false is just emotion or nonsense, or and we can ignore that. And uh, but then there were some people, particularly at Oxford University, who said that no, wait a minute, you know we can't just write off all of those other kind of sentences because there are certain kind of sentences that are actually doing something different. Uh, so let's see what they're doing. Now, now we go back to the examples. So let's see what they're doing. Uh, they're not just saying something true or false. They're actually trying to do something. So this one is like, hey, would you be interested in being my Valentine? Of course. Okay, just checking. I wasn't actually, uh, I, I actually, I wasn't actually going to ask you to be. So here, this is supposed to be a joke because when we when we read the first one, we assume that what the person is trying to do here. Um, we don't know if, which one is male, which one is female, which doesn't matter. Maybe they're neither or both. Uh, I don't know what. But anyway, I think that's purposeful. Um, so would you be interested in being my Valentine? We would read this as an attempt to ask the person, actually, not even though it's a question about would you be my Valentine. Um, 
you know, so we would read that as a question of inviting the person to be my Valentine, not just asking the person's opinion, right? So kind of an indirect way of asking, would you be my Valentine, by hedging it in the sense of, would you be interested in, rather than just saying, would you be my Valentine? And then the person says, of course, reading it that way, uh, but then this person kind of backs off and says, well, I was just asking your opinion, I wasn't going to ask you to be my Valentine, right? So that seems like a horrible joke. but. Um, the point is that we are used to people doing something with words that isn't straightforwardly what they're saying. This is what we call indirect speech acts. Um, and a lot of times when we say something like this, so like this one, uh, just text me if you go anywhere beside Pierce's house. Oh, mom, that is so totally unreasonable. How would you like to text me every time you went someplace? Good idea, I'll start tomorrow. He says that was sarcasm, not a suggestion. So she's taking his speech act, his what he's what what he's saying, or what he she is uh, assuming he's trying to do with what he's saying um, as a suggestion. When when really what he meant was it was a rhetorical question that was meant as sarcasm. Um, and then one time uh, I was I was. Uh, writing with a friend of mine and he said we were talking about this Zaiwa grammar we were editing a book together and said oh Anton said, sent his Zaiwa grammar and dictionary to share with whoever does the Zaiwa in our, the book we were editing so I said that's very nice of him are they soft copies right so why do you think I asked are they soft copies anybody I wanted him to send them to me right and so, so all he wrote back was yes they are it's like uh, you know, it's like, hello, you, you know, this is it's such a, for me, it was a very obvious question, like, can you send me the soft copies? But instead, he just said, yes, they are. So, you know, there is this whole inferential thing going on that when, how do you infer the person's intention in, what, you know, what is the speech act? So is my speech act really asking, are they soft copies? Or is my speech act asking, can you send me copies? Um, or like this one, this was with this Lily, this woman who used to clean for me. Uh, and she says, hi, good morning, Rendy. She always called me Rendy. Uh, good morning, Rendy. Today I sick. I can go to your house. So uh, even though she wrote, I can go to your house, I understood what she meant, uh, that she can't go to my house. Uh, and so I said, OK, hope you feel better soon. And she said, thanks. So even when the person, what they're saying isn't really what seems like what they intend, you can figure out what their intention is and, and go with it. And this is a really good, nice example of something where, these, where the intention is totally opposite of the thing. So this is at Halloween. This is in front of my house and my neighbor upstairs, 37A, uh, he, the, he has a young boy and the young boy put this up, keep, it says keep out. Right? Yeah. Uh, so at Halloween, and now actually, does anybody think that that means keep out? Well, so at Halloween, you know what Halloween they do? They do this uh, trick-or-treating. And so within our community, they organize everybody to, um, uh, you know, the kids can go around and trick-or-treat, but not every family participates. So you have to register to participate and you put a mark, you put some kind of mark or something on your door. And so they put this up. Which says keep out, but it means we are participating in Halloween, so you can come in and ask for candy or whatever. So I thought this was brilliant. Uh, so it's actually saying the opposite. You know, keep out means, but done in this way, it's like supposed to scare you. I'm really scared. Uh, you're supposed to be scared like that, and so the kids would then go there and knowing that, that they can get candy up there. Okay, so back to where this all comes from. So this logical positivism, uh, the early 20th century, they were um, saying these, you know, a lot of this stuff was, was meaningless and uh, they were trying to create a perfect, especially Wittgenstein, who was one of the key people in the whole development of this logical positivism. He, they were trying to create a perfect language for describing the world and so he identified that you know math and uh, logic are really work with tautologies. You know, in other words, like a mathematical equation: one plus one equals two. 
that's a tautology. They actually mean the same thing. Uh, but in real language, it's kind of different. And uh, so uh, in trying to create this perfect logical language that would reflect the world, he set the limits on what we can know and what we can say. And he said, we shouldn't talk about things we can't say as true or false. He said, all logical and mathematical statements are tautologies, and truth is only relevant when talking about how the proposition treats the world. So that really limited things. And he himself, very shortly after, that was his PhD dissertation. But shortly after that, he said, oh, that's all uh, nonsense, actually. Uh, and he later came 180 degrees, and he said, no, meaning is use. Meaning, he is now one of the, uh, the kind of seminal thinkers in terms of uh, functional linguistics, because he was one of the first people to talk about meaning as use. Utterances are only explicable in relation to the activities in which they play a role. The meaning of a word is revealed in its use, and he called these activities language games. The rules are learned and made manifest by actually playing the game. But early on, they had this idea that you know you had to test them. But then there were people at Oxford University, not far from Cambridge, where uh, uh, Wittgenstein was. So actually. It's kind of weird. Wittgenstein did this 180 degree thing where he was at Cambridge and he was originally one of the founders of logical positivism. And then later, a few years later, he joined with the Oxford people in being exactly the opposite and saying that, no, uh, it's this so-called, what they called the Oxford School of Ordinary Language Philosophy, where they started looking at real language, not just some logical language that's really not useful for anything. Um, so particularly this guy, John L. Austin, and then later his student, John Searle, they were trying to develop a unified theory of the meaning of utterances, but within a framework of general theory of social activity. So seeing languaging as an activity, in other words, communication as an activity. And Grice was also at Oxford, uh, and he also saw it language, or what we do with language as just one type of the goal-directed behavior. So we'll talk about more about that when we get to lecture five. But but Austin uh, and Searle argued that not all pseudo statements are trying to be statements. That is, they are not intended or only intended part to record or impart straightforward information about some facts. They're intended to be something quite different, uh, which uh, he called them performative verbs in this case, because they have a very straightforward performative, performative sense. So if you say something like, I bet you six pence it will rain tomorrow, just by saying those words, you are actually betting the person. Uh, and, or if you say, I hereby christen this ship the HMS Flounder, you know, when you christen the ship, you smash a bottle of champagne on it and all of that. You actually, by saying those words, you're doing the christening. Uh, or if a president of a country says, I declare war on Zanzibar or wherever, by saying those words, they're doing it. They're creating the situation of war. And apologize. Apologize is very different from I'm sorry. Because when you say I apologize, you actually are apologizing. When you say I'm sorry, you're not really apologizing. You could say, oh, I'm sorry, you're an idiot. You know, uh, it's it's. It's not really an apology. It's just talking about your emotions. You're sorry about something, but what are you sorry about? Uh, whereas apologize is straightforward. If you say, I apologize, there's no question there. You have apologized. Uh, or I dub this or Walter, you know, like when the queen, the queen picks a, a, a sword and smacks a guy in the shoulder and the head. And then she says, I dub thee, Sir Walter. You know, you become a sir, uh, member of that elite in England. And uh, so dub just means a name. So you actually are given that name. And by her saying that, you get that name. Uh, or I object in a, in a world, uh, in a courtroom, the lawyer just says, I object. And by saying I object, he's objecting. Right? Uh, or a judge saying, I sentence you to 10 years of hard labor. By saying that, he is sentencing the person. Uh, I, in a will, if you write, I bequeath you my gold watch, that, then you have legally given the watch to that person. Uh, I give you my word, and you promise. Then you, have, by saying I give you my word, then you have given the word, your word, and you have promised. Or I warn you that trespasses will be prosecuted. You are warning the person when you say that. So these are all what he called 
performative verbs because by saying the sentence in this particular way, it has to be in this particular way, and it has to be by the right person at the right time in the right situation. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Then you actually do the action, so you're performing something. Um, but to step back a minute before we get into the performative concept, he talked about speech acts as uh, including three different types of acts. So the, the locutionary act, which is the saying of something, basically saying something, which also includes a phonetic act, uh, you know, saying some kind of noises, a phatic act, you know, the kind of uh, interaction you have with the other person, the references you make, things like that. Um, but basically, the locutionary act is just saying something. Uh, the illocutionary act is what you are doing with that saying, right? So you're making a statement, you're making an offer, or you're making a promise, or you're making a threat, or you're warning the person. So by uttering that sentence, by virtue of the conventional force associated with it, or its explicit performative paraphrase, the term speech act is now often used for just elocutionary act rather than for all the other types of speech act, but he meant all three of these types, including perlocutionary act, which is bringing about some effect on the audience by means of uttering the sentence, but not, not just the elocutionary act, the effect of the elocutionary act, but some kind of side effect. So, for example, if I say there is a bull in the field, I am... I am telling you about something, but I may scare you by telling you that. So the scaring you would be the perlocutionary effect of it. I'm warning you, but the effect may be that you got scared. And so you that's the perlocutionary effect. <coughs> Sometimes it's called perlocutionary effect or perlocutionary act. <coughs> so a locution would just be, he said to me, kiss her. So uh, kiss her would be the, the locutionary act. The illocution would be, he urged me to kiss her. Uh, the perlocution would be, he persuaded me. So you can urge somebody, but they wouldn't be persuaded. But if they are persuaded, then, then that's the perlocution. <coughs> now, the locutionary act has meaning. It includes the meaning of the, of the saying. And an illocutionary act has force. So we often talk about illocutionary force. So what is the illocutionary force of a sentence? In other words, what is the intention of the the uh, speaker in terms of these acts, um, and what are they, why are they saying it? So are they trying to make a statement? Are they trying to warn somebody or threaten somebody or whatever? Uh, so that's the force uh, in saying something. And a perlocutionary act is the achieving of certain effects by saying something. So to put it in a more formal way, in saying X, uh, I was doing Y or I did Y, that's the illocutionary act. So by saying, you know, I pronounce you man and wife, I was pronouncing them man and wife. And I did pronounce them man and wife. So that's the elocutionary act. So by saying X, by saying there's a bull in the field, I scared the person and I was scaring him. That's the prolocutionary act. In saying I would shoot him, I was threatening him. By saying I would shoot him, I alarmed him. So, um, so this is the difference. So th this is the uh, elocutionary act. This is the prolocutionary effect. So now, going back to what I mentioned earlier, they, there are so-called felicity uh, conditions. Felicity just means it's happy, right? So you, when you're doing this, um, for the uh, speech act to be felicitous, in other words, for it to be happy, or you to be happy in the effect that it has or something, um, there are certain conditions have to hold. So there must be exists an accepted conventional procedure having a certain conventional effect, that procedure including the utterance of certain words by certain persons in certain circumstances. So that means like, if you want to have a wedding, you can't just walk up to somebody and say, your husband and wife, uh, like that. There has to be a certain conventional procedure for pronouncing somebody man and a wife. Uh, and it includes the uttering of certain words like, I now pronounce you man and wife. Uh, and certain persons uh, have to be there. So it has to be somebody who's got the legal or some other uh, right to pronounce you man and wife. I can't just go walk down the street and say, hi, you're a man and wife. Hi, you're a man and wife. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. Um, there has to be this, uh, you have to be the right person. 
And so the particular persons and circumstances in a given case must be appropriate for the inv invocation of a particular procedure. So aside from uh, the, the person who is in charge of the ceremony, for example, the people who are getting married should want to get married. You know, they should be the right people there. In other words, it's people who are supposed to get married. In other words, and especially in places where you have to sign uh, forms at the end of weddings. I don't know if you do that here. I haven't participated in a wedding here. But in some countries, the, the husband and wife actually sign a form at the end of the wedding. Some kind of contract or something. I don't know. Um, and so it has to be the right person to sign that. Uh, so this is all, uh, you know, again, part of the, what's the felicity conditions or the right things. The procedure also has to be executed by all the participants correctly and completely. So you, if you are the presiding judge or priest or whatever who is doing the wedding, you can't just do part of the whole ceremony and then expect it to have effect. You have to finish everything. You have to do it all. And if the groom can't walk out halfway through the wedding and then expect that the wedding is still going to be good. So uh, it has to be completely uh, done completely and uh, correctly uh, for the whole the whole um, thing mentioned in one there, uh, A1. Where as often the procedure is designed for use by persons having certain thoughts or feelings or for the inauguration of certain consequential conduct on the part of any participant, then a person participating in and so invoking the procedure must in fact have those thoughts or feelings and the participant must intend so to conduct themselves. Now what that just means is if you make a promise, you intend to keep it, right? So if you say, I, uh, I owe you $10 or I promise to pay you back $10 or I promise you I'll be there on time, then you should have the feelings and thoughts that, oh, I'm going to be there on time. You know, you're not just lying. So this A, B, and C, the reason why they call it A, B, and C, one and two, is because they're actually kind of different. I'll talk more about that in a second. But um, so you can see that this one is really not about the formal, um, you know, execution of the act, but in the kind of subjective attitude of the person in doing it. Uh, so if they don't have these feelings, then they're being ins insincere and they're basically lying if they promise something that they don't. You know, so it's like Donald Trump promising to do stuff. Um, so they're insincere and lying. Uh, and then in C2, they must actually conduct themselves subsequently. It means you keep your promises or you, you do you know, pay back what you're, you're supposed to pay back or you, whatever it is that you said you were going to do, you do it. So these are the three things. And they, um, there's a distinction, as I mentioned, between A, B, and C, uh, A, A and B versus C. As if A and B are violated, the act is not achieved at all. So, you know, it just doesn't go through. Whereas if C is violated, the act is achieved, but because of the violation of C, such as being insincere, there's an abuse of the procedure. Uh, in other words, you have lied or you have uh, promised something you don't intend to keep the promise. So the first type, Austin calls misfires, and the second type he calls abuses of the procedure. There's also a distinction between the A and B types in, 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 of infelicity as A being called misinvocations by Austin as either there is no procedure or there is one but it cannot be made to apply in the way attempted. And whereas with C, it can also be called misapplications. Uh, in the B cases, uh, in the latter type here meaning B, sorry. Uh, the, the B cases, the procedure is okay and it does apply okay but there is a problem with the execution of the procedure. So maybe it's they said the wrong words or they did something that they shouldn't have done during the procedure and it kind of messed things up. So this one he calls misexecutions with the B1 type being flaws in the conduct of the procedure and B2 being hitches in the conduct of the procedure. So he, this is his summary. Now, this is the, the thing that I don't really get is the, they, they find these things and it's sure, it's an interesting concept to think of, okay, when we're speaking, we're doing something. But then they try to break it down into all these different things. Uh, there are still a lot of people who work within this framework. I just downloaded a paper two days ago from the Journal of Pragmatics, uh, where people are talking about uh, speech acts in a certain situation. I uploaded it actually to Blackboard. 
in case you want to see what kind of current work in speech act theory is doing, or at least using these concepts. So a lot of times they're not really working within the whole framework of speech act theory, but they're just using the concept of speech acts for other purposes. Because it, it's true that there, are, you know, we do always talk about um, di doing different types of speech acts. Uh, so uh, I would, I'm not going to require you to memorize all of this stuff about misfires, misinvocation, mis-executions. I don't even remember this stuff if I'm not looking at it. So don't worry about that. Um, what's more interesting is that when you get away from these explicit performatives, you uh, find that any th that sentence can do any kind of speech act. And so this is when it becomes really interesting. But it also shows that a lot of this other stuff that they were focusing on as performatives, they really focused a lot on counting how many performatives they were and how, what's the exact structure you need to have for it and all this other stuff. But in reality, that's really a tiny part of language. But we're always doing speech acts. Every sentence we say is a speech act. So uh, it, it doesn't make sense to just think that you know you have to focus on this one specific type of very minor uh, uh, aspect of the language. So, you know, explicit performatives are like the ones I, I read to you earlier, uh, but it's possible to perform a speech act by using a simple explicit, uh, not explicit, uh, like go, uh, get out of here, you know, kind of thing, uh, instead of I order you to go. Now, one of the weird things that developed in the history of linguistics was in the 60s, 1960s, uh, when the speech act theory was kind of still uh, very um, uh, popular, I guess you might call it, and influential, there were some people called the generative semanticists. Uh, they were former students of Chomsky, who Chomsky threw out the door uh, because they tried to talk about meaning. Uh, Chomsky didn't want to talk about meaning at all, and they started to talk about meaning. But they were trying to do it from within the Chomsky paradigm, which meant seeing all meaning as being in the structure of words and sentences. So they tried to diagram sentences so that all the meaning that is expressed by that sentence is in their diagrams, which made them very complicated because there's so much meaning that we can create around a sentence. And, and there's a little description of it in the book, but I told you to skip it. If you're interested in weirdness, you can read that section. It's just a short section about the performative hypothesis. But because they had this, this strange idea that all meaning had to be in the sentence of those things, when they saw a word like go as, a, as, as an order to leave, they said, oh no, in reality, the structure is I order you to go. So they would say that this part, this I order you to, is just covert. It's in the structure, but it's just the guy didn't say it. So it's there. And you can diagram it, but all the person said was go. Uh, but the rest of it is, is just there because it has to be in the structure. That was their idea, that the meaning has to be in the structure. So they had this so-called performative hypothesis that every sentence had a performative tag in front. So when I say to you, uh, uh, like, uh, I just ate lunch, it would be, I state to you, I just had lunch, right? So every sentence had, I state to you, or I order you, or I warn you, or something. As part of the sentence, when they, when they do their linguistic analysis, they would have to have that in there. And that, that really didn't last very long, because everybody was like, are you for real? You know, it's like, come on. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, so after a short time, they gave it up. And what's interesting about in the history of linguistics, I have a, actually a, a class next semester more about the history of the way we think in linguistics, which is quite interesting, how our way of thinking about language has changed over the years. But what happened is these former students of Chomsky, who were hardcore formalists, and, uh, and then they, they were thrown out by Chomsky because of their interest in meaning. And so they tried some of these crazy things like the performative hypothesis, and then realized that that didn't work, but they kept studying meaning. And they were the ones who actually invigorated the whole field of pragmatics, because the more they looked at it, the more they realized it's not in the structure. It's in your interpretation. So people like Lakoff, 
both Lakoffs, Robin Lakoff and George Lakoff, they were students of Chomsky, you know, all of these people, Georgia Green herself was a student of Chomsky. She was one of these uh, generative semanticists. All of these people were, were kind of uh, thrown out by Chomsky, and so they figured, well, you don't want us to talk about meaning, so we're really going to go hardcore and talk about meaning. And they, they, they really invigorated the whole field of pragmatics, which really wasn't a field until they came along and, and built it up. Uh, you had, like I said, you had the Oxford philosophers and stuff, but in linguistics, not that many people really paid attention to it. It was these guys who, who really developed it. And so um, it's kind of a weird chapter. And th there's actually the, the generative semantics fighting the Chomskyans later on. They're, they're, we call it the Linguistics Wars. The, and there's a book by a guy named Randy Allen Harris called The Linguistics Wars, because it was another weird chapter when they were fighting each other about how linguistics should be. Anyway, a little side thing. Uh, so the thing is, is when you say something like there is a bull in the field, it may be a warning that you know this bull could be dangerous, or it could be just a description of the scenery, or it could be something else, right? Uh, where implicit performative generally are ambiguous in this way. So if I say go, or if I, you know, man, or is a gay, you can just use one word. And to assume that all the meanings in that one word is crazy, but you know, uh, very often there will often be uh, uh, kind of disambiguating gestures or something. So that's why you have to take into account the entire uh, ostensive act, both the speech and the the, the uh, gestures and things. So what uh, what they did is they came up with these tests for for true performatives. Uh, so if you can add the word hereby to the sentence, like I hereby bet you $20, then that kind of makes it uh, a pr true performative, if that worries you. Uh, the sentence is first person singular, present indicative, and active in English. Now, they only looked at English. Uh, they didn't look at any other languages in this regard. Of course, other languages, it would be different. Um, and then they were, they, they broke it into these three types, explicit performatives, like I thank you, I apologize, I criticize, I censor, I approve, I bid you welcome, I congratulate you. Half descriptive, where you're really talking about your feelings, I am grateful, I am sorry, I blame, I approve of, I welcome, I am glad about. Uh, and then just simply descriptive, uh, where you say I feel grateful, I repent. Uh, you're not really repenting when you say I repent. It's it's not. It doesn't work the same way as apologize. I'm shocked by. I'm revolted by. I feel approval for something. <clears throat> so, the so you can see there's a little bit of a difference. Like I approve of, uh, and I feel approval. Uh, actually, we don't say that very often. I feel approval, but uh, uh, it's certainly weaker than I approve. So if you say I approve something, then that's you really approved it. Where if you say I approve of something, then you haven't approved it. You're just saying you kind of agree with it, but you haven't done any formal approval. Uh, and so he came up with tests for explicit performatives, like does it make sense, uh, or the same sense, to ask did he really? So uh, did he really apologize? If he said I'm sorry, then there's a question: Did he really apologize? Well, you're not sure. Or if he said, I did, I apologize, then you would know he apologized. Um, could he be doing the action without uttering the performative? Could he apologize without saying, I apologize? Yeah, but it, again, it would go back to this, like, I'm sorry, where maybe he's apologizing, maybe he's not. Uh, could he do it deliberately? Uh, could he be willing to do it? Uh, in this case, yeah, you would, you would have to be very deliberate uh, and if he would apologize at least, uh, and he would have to be willing. To, well, he doesn't have to be really willing. He could be apologizing without being wanting, without wanting to have to do it. Uh, could it be literally false that, for example, I criticize as distinct from blame when I have said that I criticize? So, <clears throat> uh, the idea with criticize or thank, uh, thank or apologize or whatever is that it can't be false. That when you say I apologize, I criticize, I we actually don't say I criticize you uh, like that very often. Uh, but with uh, some of the others we do. Uh, and 
it, it, could, it could, wouldn't be literally false uh, unless you were lying uh, that uh, if, you, if you said these things. But sometimes the, the difference is subtle. So if you look at, I wish you were at the bottom of the sea, I wish you were at the bottom of the sea. Uh, the first one is performative. So I wish you at the bottom of the sea means I'm making a wish for you to be at the bottom of the sea. Whereas I wish you were at the bottom of the sea is, is not performative in that sense. It's really just telling you my feelings about you that I want you to be at the bottom of the sea. Uh, so, you know, so like you write on your postcard, I wish you were here. Um, or I wish you joy versus I wish you were enjoying yourself. Or I approve this loan versus I approve of this loan. So they're quite different in their effect. And by the way, wish and hope. Uh, a lot of non-native English speakers mix up wish and hope. I'll give you an example in a minute, like this one. Uh, so looking forward to the committee meeting, wish you got good candidates. Uh, so here it should be hope you have good candidates because hope, hope is more expressing your opinion, whereas wish would be more of a performative type of thing. So he might be wishing me well, or wishing me in the sense that we, we say, I wish you well. Uh, I wish you good candidates. You could say that I wish you good candidates, but he came out in the middle with you wish you got good candidates, or it means you get good candidates. Um, so it should be more like hope you get good candidates. So we, for, for native English speakers, the difference between wish and hope are really quite strong. Uh, and, but I noticed that a lot of non-native speakers will uh, mix them up like that. So in the end, we find that statements are really just another type of elocutionary act. As I state that doesn't differ in any essential way from I testify that, or I apologize, or I thank, or whatever. Statements are open to the same infelicities and performatives. So if you read John, um, Austin's initial book, he has a book and he also has an article which basically say the same thing. So it shows you that his book is, has a lot of unnecessary stuff in it because the, the article has it all there. And he does the same thing like a lot of philosophers do. They start with one opinion and then kind of talk themselves into another opinion. And so uh, he starts off by talking about performatives as being very special. But by the end of the book, he's saying, well, actually, all sentences are performative in some way. Because even just to make a statement, you're stating that. So it's really everything is a speech act. So you cannot state how many people there are in a room unless you have been there, you guess. You are not in a position to state that just as you are not in a position to christian the ship. You cannot really make statements about another person's feelings or desires. So basically what, you know, what he was saying is that their, their subject, our statements are subject to the same uh, felicity conditions as their other performatives. And this sometimes, sometimes these things will be grammaticalized in languages. So like in... Uh, Tibetan, uh, <clears throat> there's a what we call an evidential system, where, or some now we call it mostly egophorism, egophoric system. So you can only speak from your opinion. Uh, so there's a there's a difference in marking when I say, I am Randy, and you are Dorje or whatever. So if I say, uh, Ah Randy, I am Randy, I use in. As the, as the copula there, I am Randy, it's, it's a, I, Randy, M. So the M there is yin. But if I'm talking about somebody else, I say, uh, I have to use re, a different word altogether, because I don't have the authority to say who that person is. I can't make a statement about who that person is, uh, you know, uh, justifiably. I can ask him who he is and use yin in the question, but if I make a statement about him, I have to use a different uh, uh, copula than, than I would if in my own talking for myself. So this, like here, this and the same thing if there's a book, uh, like the book is here, the book is upstairs, though I haven't seen it with my eyes. So the difference between seeing the book and not seeing the book, you have to mark that because 
these are the like the felicity conditions on your statements. It's very much that you have the authority because you've seen the thing. You have the authority to make a, a direct statement about it. But if you haven't seen it, then you can only give a, a, either an inferential. They have different marking for inferential or hearsay or other things. And uh, <coughs> Japanese also is like this, where you cannot talk about other people's desires. So you use this, uh, like if you use, if I want to say, uh, you know, no mitai, I want to drink beer. I can use this no mitai, I want to drink or want to drink, but I can't use that for somebody else. I can only use it for myself because I don't have the what we call epistemic authority to say what's going on in somebody else's mind or body. So, uh, but you can ask in the second person, you can say, no mi tai ta. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, you can use it just like in Tibetan, you can use it in the second person. But uh, uh, you can't use it in the first person uh, or in the third person because you don't have that epistemic authority in the third person. Um, it's also not the case that statements are all neatly true or false, and performatives neither true nor false. If we say France is hexagonal, hexagonal uh, you know, it has six sides, um, it is true in a rough way, and this truth is very much depends on the context, right? So if, uh, if I'm describing you know, the countries of Europe, and I say, well, you know, you can find uh, France on the map, it's kind of hexagonal. Uh, so it's not really purely hexagonal. It's not a pure, you know, geometric shape. It's just kind of roughly hexagonal. And but in most uh, conversation, normal conversation, that's good enough. So the statement, you can't say it's true. You can't say it's false. It's true enough for the context. And in pragmatics, that's really what you get is true enough. So if you ask me what time it is, and it's right now it's 5.12, I could say it's 5.15, and it might be good enough for the context. Um, I don't have to be very explicit. Before, before um, digital watches, that's what we generally did. We just rounded up to the nearest you know, half hour, a quarter hour, or whatever. We didn't give exact 12 minutes after you know, the hour. Now that you have digital watches, you can read exactly the, the thing. So, but, uh, but still, if you, if you just give it a, a true enough for the context kind of thing. So he, Austin says, it's a rough description, not a true or false one. It's possible to pronounce somebody guilty incorrectly. Uh, so it's the same kind of thing. For Austin, true and false do not stand for anything simple at all, but for a general dimension of being the right or proper thing to say, as opposed to the wrong thing, in the particular circumstances, to this particular audience, for these purposes with these intentions. So look at all of these conditions on so-called truths. Uh, so it's not, but well, it's not really truth. What he's saying is it's appropriateness. So the, you can say something, whatever it is you're saying, is all dependent on whether it's appropriate or not, it's the felicity conditions, is whether it's appropriate in that particular context to those particular people for the particular purposes and with a particular intention. So, you know, that's really changing things. It's not saying the sentence has this meaning or the sentence has this use. It's saying this is really about context and the people involved and their intentions and their purposes. It's all very pragmatic, very pragmatic. So this kind of blew people away when, he's, when he was doing this. And it's like, oh, so it's not all about sentences? Sorry. Uh, we got it wrong, all this. But these, a lot of people didn't realize how wrong they were in saying everything's in the sentence. But anyway, uh, he, uh, his, his uh, student, uh, John Searle, picked up from this and, and carried it a lot further, which I'll talk about in a minute. The only real difference is that with the non-performative or constitutive, what he called constitutive utterances, we abstract from the elocutionary aspect of the speech act and concentrate on the locutionary, whereas with the performative utterance, we abstract away from the dimension of correspondence of fact and concentrate on the elocutionary force of the utterances. So what he means is that you're focusing on, uh, in one case, you're focusing more on the actual words that were said. In the other case, you're focusing less on what the words are saying and just like, inferring the intention of the speaker. 
In both cases, you have to infer the intention of the speaker, but in one, he's arguing you pay a little bit more attention to the, the actual wording. So, but they are ambiguous. So if you say like, I'll see you later, is that a prediction? I predict that I'll see you later. Or is it a promise that I'll see you later? Is it a threat that I'll see you later? I'll warn you later, you know? Like in Chinese, 后会有期. You say 后会有期, that can be, oh, we're friendly. I really look forward to seeing you next time. So we'll meet again. But it could also be a threat kind of thing. Uh, there will be a time when we will be reckoning, you know? Um, so it's the same kind of thing. So the, you know, or when you say this is really cold, if you're drinking a cup of tea and you, and you say, oh, this is really cold, if it's a hot summer day and you're drinking iced tea, then it feels good to drink cold water or cold tea. So it would be praise for a nice cold tea. But if it's winter and you're looking forward to having a nice warm cup of tea and it's not warm, then you say, oh, this is cold. So the same sentence exactly, but it has very different uh, 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 elocutionary force. In one case, a complaint, the other case, a praise. So Green says, we need to ignore the interpretations available for any present tense verb which allow them to be used to assert habitual action, to assert that an action is scheduled, or to describe past action, historical present. So this is just about uh, the form of these um, the strict uh, uh, performative sentences. Because as I mentioned, with the performative ones, there's uh, it's first person, singular, present, indicative, active, right? So the sentence is first person, singular, present, indicative, active. But there are other sentences that have that uh, combination. Uh, oops. Uh, but she says we have to ignore the other ones because the same pattern can be used to assert habitual action, like I, I go to, to work every day, uh, to assert that an action is scheduled, you know, there's a, a game tomorrow, uh, uh, to describe past action, historical present. So sometimes when we do a narrative about past action, we actually use the present tense. So we have to show, we have to ignore all of those uses. So again, it's not even those sentences that have that form are necessarily performative because they, that, that form has other uses as well. So again, it goes back to the right situation, the right people, the right intentions, and all of that. So here, uh, my mom's house burned down. Oh, I'm sorry. Why? It's not your fault. It's nice of you to say that, but I know what I did. And then he explains, it annoys me when people interpret an obviously sympathetic I'm sorry as an apology. So I've started responding by making it one. Uh, so this is the ambiguity of I'm sorry. So I'm sorry can mean, you know, I feel pity for you kind of thing, or it could mean, uh, you know, I, I'm apologizing for something. Uh, now here's the same speech act can be understood in different ways. So Ben practice my house six to eight. Thanks for the reminder. So he's uh, a member of the band and he's saying thanks for the reminder. So he's calling the speech act a reminder. And then he talks to the other band members and they also say thanks for the reminder, thanks for the reminder. But then his father, this is his, this guy's father, uh, he says band practice my house six to eight, exactly the same words. And the other neighbors say thanks for the warning. Right? So the same exact words, but understood as a warning rather than as a reminder, different speech act. Uh, your email was rather brusque. You mean concise. You owe me an apology. I'm sorry that you don't know what brevity looks like. You're making it worse. Well, then why am I so happy? Uh, so here, the sorry definitely is not an apology, uh, even though he, she's asked him, she asked for an apology, and he says, I'm sorry, but it's obviously not an apology. Um, and here's this kind of thing. As I left, she said, you're really going out dressed like that? Mom is a master at a question wrapped around a judgment. I like to call them quudgments. Yeah. Uh, so again, saying something like, you're really going out dressed like that, it's a question, but it's also making a judgment at the same time. So that's what you call quudgments. Or right, this one, uh, Jeremy again. 
uh, Jeremy, why can't you put these in the dishwasher instead of the sink? And he says, physiology, the skeletal structure of the adolescent human makes it impossible for us to access any appliance below eye level. And then he comes back with the dishes thrown on his head and, she's, and he says, she asks, but she doesn't listen. And the father very wisely says, maybe she wasn't asking. Right, so again, a conflict in the speech acts, uh, interpretation of the speech acts. So then, any questions up to now on the basic concept of speech act? Have you had this kind of stuff before? Has anybody covered that anywhere? No. Yes? One, I get one nod. Everybody else is just blank. But where, what class did you have it in? Uh, we worked a lot with Austin speech acts in the gender classes. Oh, OK. Yeah. But that's not in linguistics, right? Oh, okay. Good. Uh, so, uh, if no other questions or comments, uh, yeah. Um, just wanted to something about the prosecutionary act. Prosecutionary act, yeah, or um, or effect. One part where like you agree that you Then you said the prosecutionary act was like you persuade me. Why is it that like still like me kissing her? Well, the immediate effect, of course, if he persuaded me to kiss her, then I'm going to go kiss her. But um, if, but the most immediate effect was how it affected me, right? So uh, it affected me by, I mean, this was the examples that he used. So I, I never thought about this question before. But yeah, because we could say that everything that follows after that was the prolocutionary effect. But, but what he meant was the immediate uh, kind of emotional reaction to the uh, to the action, to the, uh, the illocutionary force of the original statement or whatever it was. So in this case, you know, like if somebody threatens you and you get scared, or somebody tries to persuade you and you get convinced, you know, so then it's that type of thing. But it could be, maybe it's something, maybe like with ordering somebody to do something and then they go and do it, that would also be considered the prolocutionary effect. Yeah. It's, that's not the key aspect of the theory, but um, but it is interesting that you can sometimes get other effects than those intended, and that also is a prolocutionary effect. It doesn't it hasn't necessarily have to be the intended effect of the elocutionary force. So if you know I try to persuade somebody that uh, that uh, germs are bad, and then they go and they drink uh, bleach. Uh, something like that, you know, that certainly wasn't my intention. Uh, so that might be considered some kind of, you know, negative perlocutionary effect. There are a lot of people in America who actually did that. Anyway. If the what? If you didn't intend for it to happen, but it was the effect uh, of it. I mean, I have to go back and read this again, but. When he calls it an act, it may be that he's only talking about what you intend to achieve. But the way it's often taken in the literature is that whatever the effect was. So we often talk about the perlocutionary effect. So if you look at it from the point of view of effect, then it could be almost anything. But if you look at it from act, in other words, what are you trying to achieve? Because an act is something you're doing, an action. Act means action, right? So your action is trying to do something. And so probably that's the difference there, that when he was talking about it, I have to go back and see if he goes, gets, it, gets that more explicitly. But it may be that he's kind of limiting it to whatever it was intended, and that he didn't mean to cover unintended things. But, but people in the literature since then have, have used it to mean any effect that the speech act has. A good question, so. That's a good question. Any other questions? OK, so his, his student, John Searle, who ended up at Berkeley later on, UC Berkeley, uh, he, uh, he's actually still around. Uh, and uh, I was quite old and retired now. But he um, kind of developed the idea of speech acts by looking at indirect speech acts, what they kind of uh, conventionalized way that we have of making speech acts that are not direct. In other words, not only not 
using performatives, but kind of hedging our, our speech act in a particular way. So something like, I wonder when the train leaves, right? So you're using a form that, that grammaticalized as a declarative. So it's a, it's, in English, we have grammatical, um, grammatical mood, right? So this is one of the interesting things that people were discovering is that although we have grammatical mood and grammatical mood grammaticalized because those particular patterns develop, were used over and over again by people for a particular purpose, right? You know how grammaticalization works, right? So basically you're, you do something over and over again, it gets conventionalized and that's what we call grammaticalization. It gets kind of fixed in the grammar, which means people just get habituated to using that. So our grammatical mood, so like we have declarative mood, we have interrogative mood, we have imperative mood. Not all languages have these things. It's a matter of grammaticalization. But in English, we grammaticalize them. But once you have something fully grammaticalized or conventionalized in culture generally, you can do anything you want with it. And so what happens is we have a sentence like, I wonder when the train leaves, which is a grammatical, there has a grammatical mood of declarative, but we can then take that and use it for a question or as, as you know, our attention, our, our intention is to ask a question, but we use the declarative form to do it. Or we can use the declarative as an order when you say you'd better leave now, which is a declarative form, but we're using it to give an order. Or I can use an imperative form like have a good journey as an assertion, you know, or as a, as a way to say goodbye. Uh, uh, or an imperative used as a question, tell me why you say that, right? That's a question really in terms of illocutionary force, but the grammatical form is imperative. Or who cares, which is an interrogative form, but it's also used as an, ass an assertion here, meaning no one cares. Or can you open the door for me is an interrogative used as a request. So this kind of thing, Searle, once he started getting into it, he found there's lots of them, but they have certain regularities to them. So he found that they have, uh, there's a quite a number of groups of these. So one group is where the sentence is concerned, the hearer's ability to perform the action. So can you reach the salt? Uh, can you pass the salt? Could you be a little more quiet? Um, or you could be a little more quiet uh, as a statement instead of a question. Uh, you can go now. This could be also permission. You may go now. Um, are you able to reach the book on the top shelf as a way of asking, can you give me that book on the top shelf? Uh, have you got change for a dollar as a way of begging for money? Or asking for a change, actually. Uh, but you, so we, we get so used to thinking of have you got change for a dollar as being a request for change for a dollar. But it's really, if you look at the sentence, it's just saying, do you have change? And, and just like with my friend, uh, when I asked him, do you have PDFs? And he just said, yeah. Uh, if somebody asks you, do you have change for a dollar? You could just say, yeah, and then walk away. Uh, but that's not what we would normally do. We would, we've gotten so used to these indirect speech acts that we would just understand this very directly as a request for change. A second group is sentences concerning the speaker's wish or want that H will do the action. So I would like you to go now. I want you to do this for me, Henry. I would appreciate if you could do this for me. I would be most grateful if you would help us out. I'd rather you didn't do that anymore. Uh, I'd be very much obliged if you would pay me the money back soon. So we have, these are all hedges. Uh, I would be much obliged if you would pay, you would pay me the money back soon. So in English, the more of these you, you line up, the more polite it is. Uh, and so you're kind of burying your speech act under a whole bunch of different hedges. Uh, we call them hedges. Um, and I remember when I first was learning Chinese and I was thinking, my God, they're so straightforward. They would just say, you know, you go to a restaurant and saying, would you mind bringing me a glass of water? You say, let me show you. <laughs> Bring, you know, come a cup of water. Uh, you just straightforward, right? just ordering people around. I was like, ooh, how can you do that? You know, but now I learned to be really rude. Uh, no, just kidding. But you just, it's just different cultures. So everybody has different 
contexts in which they do different things. Uh, the third group, uh, sentences concerning the hearers doing the action. So officers will henceforth wear ties at dinner. So this is an order, but it's, it takes the form of a, uh, of a declarative. Uh, and will you quit making that awful rack? And so these are also about the, the hearer doing the action. Will you quit making that awful rack? Would you kindly get off my foot? Uh, would you stop making that noise soon? Aren't you going to eat your cereal? Or sentences concerning the hearer's desire or willingness to do the action. So would you be willing to write a letter of recommendation for me? Uh, do you want to hand me that hammer over there on the table? Would you mind not making so much noise? Would it be convenient for you to come over on Wednesday? Would it be too much trouble for you to pay me the money next Wednesday? And then the sentence five, group five is sentences concerning reasons for doing A. So you can be giving an, an explanation why you're doing it. Uh, you ought to be more polite to your mother. You should leave immediately. Uh, you must continue hammering. Must you continue hammering that way? So these are all what we call uh, deontic uh, modality. Ought you to eat quite so much spaghetti? Should you be wearing John's tie? You had better go now. Hadn't you better go now? Why not stop here? Why don't you try it just once? So all of these are kind of asking reasons why the person doesn't do it or does do it. The last class also contains many examples that have no generality of form, but obviously in an appropriate context would be uttered as indirect requests, like you're standing on my foot. Uh, I can't see the movie screen while you have that hat on. Also in this class, possibly, how many times have I told you not to eat with your fingers? Uh, I must have told you a dozen times not to eat with your mouth open. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times not to wear your hat in the house. Okay, now group six, sent, he's got a lot of these uh, sentences embedding one of these elements inside another, also sentences embedding an explicit directive, elocutionary verb, inside one of these contexts. So this is where I'm talking about piling them up. Would you mind awfully if I asked you if you could write me a letter of recommendation? Would it be too much if I suggested that you could possibly make a little less noise, right? So we're layer after layer of these hedges. Uh, might I ask you to take off your hat? I hope you won't mind if I ask you if you could leave us alone. I would appreciate it if you could make less noise. This would be considered all very polite. So what he said was there are certain facts about sentences used in indirect speech, uh, speech acts. The sentences in question do not have an imperative force as part of their meaning, even though they may be understood as imperatives. The sentences in question are not ambiguous as between an imperative illocutionary force and a non-imperative illocutionary force. Uh, Notwithstanding facts one and two, these are standardly, ordinarily, normally, conventionally used to issue directives. So even though they don't have imperative force as part of their so-called sentence meaning, again, in these days they were talking about there being a difference between sentence meaning and actual meaning. Uh, and so he's saying that even though these things have not, have, really don't have any imperative force as part of their sentence meaning, they are standardly used for imperative uses, you know, what it means, issue directive, directive is like an order uh, that we normally would use an imperative for. And they're not, in the ordinary sense, idioms. In other words, they are conventionalized, but they're not something like keep the bucket. You know, he, does, he means, when he says idioms, he means something like keep the bucket, meaning to die, right? So when we say he kicked the bucket, that's to use an idiom, meaning he died. To say they're not idioms is not to say that they're not idiomatic. So they are idiomatic in the sense that they're conventionalized and sometimes the meaning isn't exactly what is it's said in the sentence. The sentence in question have literal utterances in which they are not also indirect speech requests. So you could use the same sentence in a different context where it didn't have that sense at all, the imperative sense or whatever other speech act. It would just be the straightforward so-called literal uh, meaning. In cases where these sentences are uttered as requests, they still have their literal meaning and are uttered with, with and as having that literal meaning. Um, so supposedly he's saying that you can read both meanings uh, at the same time. It's a consequence of fact seven 
that when one of these sentences is uttered with the primary elocutionary force of a directive, the literal elocutionary act is also performed. So, uh, <coughs> uh, so what he means here is that when the literal meaning and the 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 uh, uh, and the the true elocutionary force are the same, then they're both they're both done. Or actually, in all cases, they're they're both done. Uh, according to him, this is something that's very controversial. That whether two elocutionary forces are or two two elocutionary acts are, are accomplished at the same time. So if I say, "You can leave now," or "Can you leave now?" Yeah, am I really asking a question and giving a directive at the same time, or is there really just one speech act going on, and I just happen to use an interrogative to give a directive? So uh, these generalizations are just basically generalizing the the different groups. So S can make an indirect request or other directive by either asking whether or stating that a preparatory condition concerning H's ability to do A obtains. The preparatory condition is kind of like these felicity conditions, although he got into a little bit more detail about what needs to be the case for these things to work. But it's basically the same idea, preparatory condition and felicity condition. Uh, and speaker can make an indirect directive by either asking whether or stating that the propositional content uh, condition obtains. Uh, the speaker can make an indirect directive by stating that the sincerity condition obtains, but not by asking whether it obtains. So these are all uh, just a kind of statements about the groups that I just read. So you, you can compare these. So generalization three relates to group three, generalization, generalization two relates to group two. So it's basically just restating the same thing in a different way. So generalization four, S, the speaker can make an indirect directive by either stating that or asking whether there are good or overriding reasons for it for doing A, except where the reason is that H wants or wishes, uh, for example, to do A. In which case, he can only ask whether H wants or wishes to do A. Now, an interesting thing they found was <coughs> um, what they called short-circuited implicature. The idea is that uh, we haven't talked really about implicature yet, but the idea is that these sentences, when somebody says something like, you may leave now, um, you have to be able to infer that they're, not, that they're intending this as a, an imperative for you to leave, and they're not just making a statement, right? So that's an implicature. That's called, in, later when we get to Grice, that, that's called an implicature. Uh, and normally, they had a way of so-called calculating an implicature. In other words, how do you do the inference? So how do you infer the speaker's intention? So that's called calculating the inference, the, calculating the implicature. But what happens is, is that when, like with the, you know, uh, the example I used earlier, the have you type of thing, um, what, what happens is, as it becomes more and more conventionalized, um, we kind of don't do the calculations anymore. We, it's just so conventionalized, we just react immediately without even having to figure it out. So that's why they call it short-circuited. You don't have to, you know, like a, normally if you're calculating, you go from here to here through these calculations. Short-circuiting means you just go straight to here without calculating. So, <clears throat> so when somebody says, can you please close the window, so that's, can you close the window is so conventionalized as a directive or a, you know, a request that uh, you can stick the word please in there anywhere. You can say, you know, please, can you close the window? Can you please close the window? Can you close the window, please? So you can, you can even stick it right in the middle there, which technically is ungrammatical, <coughs> but because it's a fixed construction, this fixed phrase, uh, uh, this can you close the window is so fixed that you can just stick the word please in before the verb and it's okay. Uh, and that's one way to test if these uh, kind of requests are fully conventionalized because then, then they're just seen as these uh, kind of fixed constructions that you can stick the word please in there. Okay. Um, now, speaking 
more generally uh, about, well, let me, let me ask you first before I go into this, uh, any questions about indirect speech acts? Yeah. Just now on slide 22, um, example C, how is that an assertion? Have a good journey. Uh, uh, that's the way they, he analyzed it. Cyril analyzed this as an assertion. I would analyze it as a saying goodbye, but maybe saying goodbye he sees as an assertion. I, but um, Or it's like saying you will have a good journey, maybe. Uh, that's the way a lot of people, I think, would understand it, is you will have a, a good journey rather than I'm ordering you to have a good journey. So from that point of view, it would be an assertion. Any other questions? So one of the things uh, that's interesting uh, recently, or not so recent actually, uh, is the use of emoji to show uh, uh, kind of your feelings about things, which to some extent, in some cases, can also be understood as marking the uh, speech act uh, or this, the elocutionary force. So a lot of times we use them to show, like for example, uh, young people don't use it so much anymore, but I used to use the wink emoji all the time to show that I was joking about something, right? So if you're, you're worried that somebody may not understand the elocutionary force of your utterance, especially if it's you know like you're making fun of somebody or something like that, and then you want to make sure that they understand that it's a joke, then you add the, the wink emoji, because that's you know traditionally how you show you're joking is by winking. Um, and so, but more generally, you can also, uh, in this example, the professor uses it as the whole utterance. Uh, and so he's actually using this thing. So the smiling face in the first instance here is, this is from an ac ac academic paper talking about this. The smiling face in the first instance seems unproblematically unpro to express the student's happiness that he could attend the conference. And the professor interpreted it thus, particularly since the student had earlier expressed a strong desire to attend. The frowning face, in the second instance, expresses sadness or regret, consistent with the professor's comment, I wish I could be at AOIR. The second author confirmed that this was the meaning she intended when she typed the emoticon. These examples constitute expressive acts according to Searle's taxonomy. So they had a, a part of Searle, one of the things Searle did was he tried to create a taxonomy of all the different types of acts, and it got very, very complicated because there's so many different things we can do with language, right? So um, it almost didn't make any sense to try to 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 categorize everything, but he, he went to great uh, lengths to make a uh, taxonomy. Uh, and so one of the, char the, the, the uh, categories that he established was expressive acts, and there's a lot of expressive acts because we're always expressing expressing things expressing things when we're speaking. So what he, this per, these people in his paper are arguing is, uh, is that these things are elocutionary force markers marking it as expressive acts, or in this case, it is the whole act, or, it, or it reinforcing this, I wish I could be an AOR, and showing the, ex, the expressive sense of it uh, in, in the emoji as if his face was there. So this is an interesting aspect, and, and there is reality to this idea of these uh, uh, speech acts, and they also um, have different functions. Uh, so like declarations, uh, this is from Yule, where he says that the declarations, like I now pronounce you man and wife, the words change the world, right? So before you say those words, the man and wife are not, I mean, the woman and man are not man and wife, but after you say that, they are, so you've actually changed the world by saying those words. Uh, so the speaker causes the situation. The representatives, uh, like it was a sunny day, you know, a statement kind of thing, like uh, 
about something. Uh, the makes the words fit the world. So it, it's, it's a way of the speaker expressing what they believe. So they believe what they say. Expressives like congratulations. Uh, these are make words fit the world. So the it shows the speaker's feelings about the about the situation. Directives like don't touch that. Uh, make the world fit the words. So the speaker wants the, that situation to happen. And commissives like I'll be back. Uh, make the world fit the words. So it's showing the speaker's intention for some to do something. So this is another way of kind of looking at them. So a lot of there were a lot of people involved uh, in trying to kind of nail down this whole phenomenon of speech acts. And they looked at it from different ways and created lots of different taxonomies and lots of different lists of different types and different things that needed to be done for them to be correct. Uh, OK. Uh, so I leave you with this. This is the end. Uh, so this guy says, Mr. Logic, such is my name, so therefore one can assume that this comic strip is in some way about me. And then he goes into the post office and he says, do you sell postage stamps? And she says, of course. How many do you want? He says, I do not necessarily require any. I merely asked whether or not you sold postage stamps. Uh, however, I do at present require one postage stamp. And that's 16p, please. You assume that I wish to make a purchase. I merely stated I required a stamp. A purchase does not necessarily follow. However, I do at this point intend to purchase a stamp. Accordingly, I remit the sum of 16 new pence. And then this guy behind him says, are you finished yet, smart arse? Uh, my final tra financial transaction is complete, but my name is not smart ass. I was christened, and then he gets knocked in the head. So why, why would somebody make a cartoon like this, right? So this is kind of pointing out the whole speech act kind of thing, the indirect speech act type of thing. So in the first one, do you sell postage stamps? And she says, of course, how many do you want? She's understanding his speech act as uh, expressing his intention to buy stamps, right? So, uh, so then she just asks, how many do you want? And then he gives her a hard time about that, but then he says he doesn't require one. And so she, he says he does require one, but he hasn't asked yet to buy it. But she takes his statement that he requires one, which was you know, the need uh, for him to have one, as a request to buy one. And so he, she says, that's 16 pence, please. And so he says, oh, you assume that I wish to make a purchase. But he, he uh, you know, doesn't necessarily follow from what he said. But then he does buy it anyway. So you can see how these uh, indirect speech acts really smooth through our everyday interactions. If we just worked very strictly through, through a kind of logical uh, you know, coding, decoding each other's uh, things like a computer, we would we would take a lot longer just to buy a stamp or something like that. We would have to go through every step, but we can, you know, uh, miss, skip all of that by just inferring somebody's attention attention from whatever it is they say. It doesn't matter what they say as long as we can infer the intention, their ultimate intention. Then we can just move ahead with the transaction or whatever it is. Is that clear? OK. Um, I wanted to say something about the tooth slips. You guys are doing really well, the best of any class I've ever seen. So a lot of you are probably going to get tired of me just writing, great, exclamation point three, great, exclamation point three. I've never had to do that before. And uh, normally, I write lots of, lots of stuff on it that the students can't read because my handwriting is so terrible. But, uh, but this time, I find I'm writing very little. So I'm actually getting through them very quickly because you guys are really getting it. Uh, I used to give a lot more twos. This semester, so far, I think I've given one or two twos. Everybody's been getting threes, which means you're getting it. Um, this is very unusual. I don't know what's happened. Uh, it's, uh, it may be because I'm speaking more slowly. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but um, we have another. Actually, it's supposed to be the end of class. But I, we're probably we're just going to go to six every, every week. We just have to get used to that. But what I'd like you to do, if there's, does anybody have any questions first before?
What I'd like you to do is take out a piece of paper and just give me some informal comments. Don't put your name on it. Just give me some comments on how you think the course is going so far, right? So I do this every, I try to do this every semester, uh, anyway, around week six, week five or week six, um, to just to see how things are going. Uh, the, you know, the lectures, the volume of my voice, uh, how clear it is, the readings, uh, about everything to do with the course, except my, my slides. My slides, everyone in the past would say, can I have more color in the slides? You know, can I have some, you know, no. Uh, black and white is what you get, right? I don't believe in, in all these distractions and stuff. I just want you to get the content. So no dancing bears or anything in my slides. It's all just straightforward black and white. So no point in criticizing that. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, and then somebody, can somebody collect them for me and just bring them up here so I don't see who's is who's. Oh, also mention, yeah, one of the things, this is a special uh, semester because of the coronavirus thing. Uh, mention how you think it's going with us doing like 31 students in this big lecture theater and, uh, and would you prefer to do it online? Uh, last semester we did it online and it actually went okay. Uh, the students seem to be okay with it, but um, I actually prefer the in-person thing. Uh, so I thought even though it's a little bit of a risk, uh, I would we would go with try online. I'll try it in person and then if it doesn't work out, then we can go online. So let me know what you think about how we should how we can move forward. And uh, a question came up earlier about what happens if somebody gets sick. If somebody does get sick, they should stay home, of course. And then what we can do is set up a hybrid system where we are um, either we send, give them the recordings, which I'll give you anyway, uh, after the fact, or we can do a live uh, kind of hybrid Zoom or Teams uh, and live lecture at the same time. So some, that seems to be a new trend to have a dual thing where you do both the live uh, talk and you do the, the online thing at the same time. So we can also try that if we if we need to, if somebody needs to stay home. And don't forget to pick up your uh, your two slips from last time is up here. Are that comic? For what? For the comic that we saw at the end. Actually, even his final act is still indirect, isn't it? He says, I intend to purchase, and he never actually says, please give me a standing exchange. Right, yeah, I noticed that too, that he, he kind of jumps from I intend to, to actually buying it without actually stating that he intends to buy it. He just says, I do need it. However, you know, I do need it, so I will give you this. So he actually skipped one thing, yeah. You can write to the, the author of that if you want to. I didn't write that. <laughs> Say, hey, you messed up. <laughs>